what I wanted to talk about is uh, one aspect of uh, Web3, which I'm particularly interested in, which is uh, the storage aspect. So for use cases like uh, currency transactions or a voting system that's been discussed here, putting the information of the blockchain is reasonable in terms of cost. So I don't know how much information needs to be contained to cast a vote, but I can imagine that we're just talking about a few couple of kilobytes at most, perhaps less than a kilobyte to contain maybe the address, the address of the voter and maybe the vote that it's casting. So a few bytes more for the, the, the vote decision. And then we can store probably millions of uh, or billions of votes on chain and hopefully not suffer scalability issues or transaction costs that just go over the roof because the more data you process, uh, well, the more the more miners wants to actually process the data. So in terms of uh, heavy storage solution, the blockchain doesn't seem at least today to be uh, a viable option. So you can imagine that if I wanted to store backup of my laptop data, half a terabyte of, of stuff, if I was to put that on, let's say, the Ethereum network, then every single participant of the network would have to replicate half a terabyte of data just for my own backup. That, that's just not, not something that could ever scale. So there has been a number of projects going on out there that try to decentralize storage solutions. So today, you can go on Google Drive and put all your files and share it with your mates. But ultimately, Google doesn't own the data, but practically, they, they have it in their own data center. They decide to wipe this data, deny you access, or change the term of their services. They are free to do so. It's a company and they they, are, they have their own incentive to decide how they want to, to provide a service. So in terms of decentralized services that could offer an alternative, actually, I think over 20 years ago, we already had solutions. So I don't know if you guys remember, we had technologies like uh, eDonkey that came out and Shazam and not Shazam, what was the name? Nutella. And then Torrent came about, uh, which are peer-to-peer -peer solutions. So basically, I keep a copy of the data on my, on my uh, local machine, but I, I open it up to the network. So other peers may make a, a replicate of that, especially if they're interested in that data. And that may get duplicated across multiple peers and the, the, the transaction speeds and the scalability is actually pretty good. I mean, I, I don't know if you guys still use tor torrents, but I, I, I love it. So now what's happening that is a bit more modern, I would say, and touches on the Web3 kind of technologies. One of them you probably heard about is IPFS. IPFS takes a slightly different approach to peer-to-peer -to -peer sharing, where not only it allows any participant to grab a copy of the uh, data from uh, your node and replicate it and redistribute it and have other public copies being made openly on the network, but it also provides um, a hashing system that allows to retrieve um, a copy of a particular file wherever it is on the network. So I would say that IPFS has done some interesting headways to provide what could be seen as an alternative to torrent, where we don't even need to have this kind of trackers. You just make a search for the content you're looking at, which is basically uh, an identifier, which is the hash of the, the file or bucket that you, you're after, and you may retrieve the data. Here's, here's the thing about IPFS that troubled me when I started looking into it. I set up my IPFS node. I've put a bunch of data in it. So my non-sensitive pictures and other documents I have on my machine, pretty much. My tunes and a few movies. And then I was thinking, well, that's great. Now, if somebody is interested in one of these files, there is a very good chance that he's going to make a copy of it, keep it locally. There is a very good chance that other people may be interested in that file, make a copy of it. So I could safely assume that even if I turn off my machine and uh, ask, try to access my, my data from another machine, I just need to connect to the IPX network and there's probably going to be multiple replications out there. Now, that's the one, that's not going to be the case for a file that, let's say, has no incentive for anybody to make a copy of it. There are some good Samaritans out there who are actually providing what's called pinning in this uh, in IPFS. Basically, they take the data, they pin it, they make it available, uh, a replicate is available, but they don't necessarily have uh, an interest in using that data. That's not necessarily the case for every data you may want to put on that network. It may very well be the case that you would hope to keep uh, a backup of your information, but no replication exists. Or worse, some replication may exist, but then they disappear and then you lose your data. So I, I don't quite know within IPFS 
what is their hope on that matter, uh, with that matter. But the same uh, initiatives, basically the same group that is behind APFS, are on to uh, providing blockchain technologies. And guess what? They have been working on Filecoin. Filecoin, I think, is very promising in the sense that. They are built by this pretty much the same team as who is behind IPFS, and they are trying to build an economy that would incentivize um, basically storage providers that could be individuals or companies, uh, you know, data farms, data farmers basically, that would offer their bandwidth and, uh, and storage capacity in exchange for tokens to guarantee the replication for a period of time. I think they, they have a, a, a deal scheme where basically you commit to replicate and serve the data for a period of a year, maybe a month. I can't remember exactly what the tiers were. And if you honor that promise, then you will get issued a number of file cards. So that will incentivize uh, who has the capacity to replicate data to, to make it available to worldwide users. Uh, and again, as an individual, you may also opt for that. So instead of simply using IPFS, you may actually uh, put a deal on the uh, the Filecoin network and basically give away your resources that you may not use. Let's say free space you have on your local machine. You're not going to make a lot of money if it's just a local small laptop, but that's actually uh, uh, an economy that can be built. So. I've actually uh, got hands-on with this tech uh, because I wanted to actually understand how it practically works and would like to, to give it a quick demo of a proof of concept. So what did I do? The same group, again, same guys, they've launched this initiative, the web 3 storage project. Uh, <clears throat> so what is that? I will summarize my understanding of it. I mean, of course, you can take a look. I will share the links at the end. Um, but this is basically uh, an API that they are uh, building to interact with uh, both the IPFS network and the Filecoin system, all in one. The Visiting API allows a user to uh, push files through it. Those files will land on the IPFS network, and they are taking care of actually automatically creating um, a deal to have at least three replications being maintained um, of, of the, the data you pushed. And then, of course, you can retrieve the data. You can uh, also perform uh, multiple manipulation on it. I think it's mostly retrieving, creating buckets, and a number of other things. So the API as it stands is pretty basic, but I think it's it's a it's a fantastic way to actually get into using the technologies I've just I've just mentioned here, which is basically IPFS and and Filecoin. I think with using IPFS, well, it's not that complicated, but you've got to run your own node. If you want to to have full control over over it, you've got to figure out quite a lot of uh, steps to actually get, get it to work. It, it just takes a while and it's also pretty heavy about resources. Uh, try to run it on my phone, it doesn't work. So um, so back to Web3 storage, what I've done is I tried to see what can we build on top of uh, that API uh, that will somewhat replicate the Google Drive capabilities. I mean, without the sheets and uh, docs and all of that, just the ability to to put even large data and be able to navigate them. So I'll open that up. Um, uh, it's also to note that this this proof of concept currently is deployed on the, the traditional web. Uh, so it is not, in a way, it's not web free. It's, it's traditional web. It's not fully decentralized. So, But, but there is nothing preventing me from from actually deploying this this web application into the IPFS network. Because here again, uh, static files can be fetched from the IPFS network and we can even use bridges to actually allow people who are still on the traditional network to access it. I still haven't gone through these steps, but that's very feasible to deploy the an applica a web application itself on a distribution, distributed storage, IPFS, default DNS resolutions to actually have even traditional users on the, the old web or the current web to access it so that not only the data itself is decentralized, but also the service that you build is uh, decentralized. So here, I only have one file in here, which I had uploaded, which is a picture of, uh, of Morocco. Um, but basically, I, well, I would do, I upload a file and then I will show you briefly what what Web3 storage takes care of doing on, on my behalf. All right, so that's a it. So we have here flower picture. Um, I'm going to mouse over this link, click on it actually. So here's the IPFS 
handle to that file. So Web3 is doing a very good job. I mean, they, 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 the API is pretty solid at this point. They've replicated the data at least on one uh, API APS, you know, via the, the Filecon deal. The Filecon deal itself takes a while, but they immediately put the data into at least one IPFS node. And this is the CID, so it's just a hash of the file that I've uh, that I've pushed I've pushed in onto what you see here is actually a bridge because I'm accessing it in your city. I can actually access that file um, via the IPFS protocol itself. Um, so I'm not going to demo, but you may give it a try if you want. And that will also retrieve the data. Oh, the question is, what's that? It's just a square, right? The reason is because I'm encrypted. I'm encrypting the content of the image because to keep in mind, everything on these networks is public. The very nature of the decentralized approach means that anybody who connects to the network and wants to retrieve any data that lies on this network will be able to fetch it. So obviously, it is not quite the same as uh, as the Google Drive uh, storage solution where you, you authenticate with Google, you may, they make sure that you are who you claim to be and, and then you you and only you have access to your file unless you, you give access to, to other users. In the decentralized data world, well, at least as it stands, anybody can access data. So if you put something up there, you may not want to actually leave it in plain view. So that's what I've done with the system. So basically before uploading the file, I'm, I'm, I'm simply uh, uh, encrypting it in the browser and then pushing the file up there. So I try to access it. Of course, I can't see it. I can only see it from within the app, which decrypts the data being retrieved and then displays the image. I think I've gone through a, a, a very practical example of what can be done with today's state of uh, Web3 storage technologies. There are other uh, initiatives that are uh, being built. To be honest, I'm not very familiar with, with them, but I know Storge is quite promising as well. I'm not sure where they are in terms of uh, actually offering a, a convenient user interface, what Web3 Storage is doing, which is basically building an, an, an API so that people can get their hands uh, on the tech itself without getting into the, the lower level aspect. What else can I cover? Is there is there any question at this point? It's pretty much clear what I've tried to describe. So, yeah, so so you said that, um, you know, everything is public, right? So when you upload it, it's like anybody can stuff, right? Yep. Um, did, you, did you mention that um, things can't be modified? So, so specifically for IPFS, things cannot be, well, actually, they, they, they could be modified. But, but the, the basic aspect of IPFS is files are not modified. If you modify a file, it will generate a new, um, a new uh, CID, which is the hash of the file. So if you were to upload um, a, a slightly different version of this picture, then the hash itself, even if it changes by one byte, the hash will change. So that will create a new handle, a new CID, a new pointer to that file. Um, that's at least the, the foundation for national functioning of IPFS. I know that they've implemented um, another feature on top of that, that basically provide a single handle. I'm not sure what kind of hash it is because it can't just be a hash of the file. It's basically a handle that, that supports altering the data that gets retrieved when, when user hits that handle. Okay, so it could be it could be like a pointer to the hash and then you can update the pointer to point to a different hash. I so think that's how it functions, yeah. Yes, uh, I can't recall. Um, I can't recall exactly how yeah. how they've implemented it, but I think it's something like that. So, uh, did you cover why why IPFS is used for and commonly used for NFTs? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, maybe uh, give a few words about that if, if you haven't. Well, I was. Uh, so my thinking so, is that because it's immutable. Oh, sorry. Are you giving the words, or did you ask me to give the words? Yes, I, th I think I think the immutability immutability aspect of IPFS oh. makes it very suitable to be the, the storage reference of the NFT to guarantee that the NFT doesn't disappear from the from the planet. The the obvious thing about NFT is if you try to put the NFT itself, which is, uh, let's say, the piece of digital art onto the chain, it's again, it's going to be too expensive and it's not going to scale. So it needs to be stored somewhere cost efficient and IPFS is probably the, the most viable uh, option to do that. I, I would yeah, imagine, I, I, I would actually imagine because again, settling back to my first observation about IPFS and I be, may be wrong, but I am personally still concerned about a network that is really well designed but lacks the incentive for uh, the community to actually 
give away their resources for free for anybody to profit from that network. So I think I can imagine uh, the Filecoin offering would even more nicely tie to the NFT aspect because again, because it's blockchain, you could have actually uh, a wallet with uh, some some value stored that automatically will use the deal as long as the NF- NFT is being traded. Yeah, so the, the NFT will keep the address, the, the hash, to the right. storage and then you the NFT is fungible so that hash cannot be changed and then the uh, the storage is also you can't mute you can't change what's in that address so it's it, it keeps both sides of it. it it makes sure that's the that the non-fungible token really is non-fungible exactly exactly i think it's a bit of a shame i don't know what's the ratio of nfts being stored on ipfs but i think a lot of nfts are just stored somewhere with no guarantee that they would survive uh, time or even if they do people may actually uh make a copy of it somewhere else but then they're gonna have to alter the nft itself to update the reference the the hashing system of ipfs in a way also makes it more robust in a sense that the hash represents the content itself which also means that it can be verified again the content of the file yeah so so in the future if ipfs is used for like if it's used like the web the current web is used and it's going to be very dangerous because people will put things up by accident and then they can't change it and they can't remove it it's it's one concern yes my uh, impression is that the deletion will never be foolproof even if you immediately remove it after the fact because there is no way to prevent someone to make an immediate copy of it i think encryption is the solution and and i foresee that there will be improvement over the user experience by of applications or apps that get used uh, apps or web apps that get used to interact with the networks that will by default enforce encryption even if it's to share the key publicly if that's a file that is intended for distribution but i think i I can imagine that encryption by default will help people adopt people who are less tech savvy adopt this technology otherwise as you say i think a lot of people will make terrible mistakes in assuming that they are still using the same kind of technology that they used to use which is these are my files nobody can see them because i'm authenticated because uh, a company is keep taking care of me in this world everything is is uh, in the world of, of uh, distributed distributed data everything is open there is uh, if it's not encrypted there, there is no way to prevent any participant to to see contents uh, i don't have anything else to cover uh, i wouldn't claim that i've covered a, a fraction of what decentralized data may be uh, now and in the future. Uh, I've, I wanted to uh, talk about what I think are the most promising and most uh, most uh, um, stable, advanced, mature solutions today that definitely tie to Web3. I encourage anybody to, to take a look at themselves, IPFS, Dataio, Filecoin, Coin and other blockchain networks that, that are, are, are doing phenomenal work in pushing the, the, the adoption of the crypto economy to incentivize distributed data. Um, and I highly suggest you to actually play with Web3 storage, especially if you, you're not familiar with IPFS or, or blockchain, because all you need to know is basically JavaScript executing your browser and you will be able to enter to interact with with an anti-measury but you will be able to somewhat interact with uh with filecoin and then ipfs the the account is free by the way so there's really not not any excuse because you can sign up for free get one terabyte of data and, and start interacting with uh, the tech so uh just thinking out loud like online piracy would be really would be a bad use of web3 of specifically of ipfs right because it's like once somebody uploads a pirated copy of something it can't be removed and it can't be modified yep it's just it's there forever as it stands right now i think it's pretty wild i think i would imagine that a lot of pirate copyrighted content is is shamelessly put onto the ipfs network but uh, as it stands i believe that the law enforcement are actually considering treating anybody who shares the data as in uh, as in infringement so a bit like the way they've been attempting to track illegal copies of content via the torrent network and the e donkey network i mean in the torrent and e network the best way for the authorities to tackle the problem was to hit the trackers or to hit the search engines of um, torrent files because that's usually the entry point for people to discover uh, content. I think in the world of IPFS, it's going to be a bit different because th- there will probably not be an entry point such as a tracker or a, a, a meta search because the, 
the network itself can be searched directly. And I think that they will have no other recourse than actually hit the identified redistributors of content. Uh, I've heard remorse that they would be engaging with ISPs to flag content and basically penalize whoever is using the ISP network to distribute these illegal content. I think it's going to be a very tough call to monitor this kind of activities on, on such network. It's just going to make, it's just another fold more complicated than it is in the Web3 world or Web2 world. Yeah, like, so like if I ran an IPFS node, do I have control over what what is stored on my node, you know? Well, at this stands, uh, you, you would have to take a look at the data that is being stored in your node. But if you, if you don't replicate just the data, then, then data can't just get into your nodes randomly. You're in full control of your node. Now, if you if it's free for all and you replicate this, but you pin data from, from other nodes, then you are potentially posting content that is copyrighted and then you're you yourself may face infringement notice because of that. The same way people have received letters because they were using a software like Nidonkey or Torrent that was distributed seeding content and they networks are being monitored and if they get so sometimes they they got flagged. I would say I would say are we are in control on our nodes. And I imagine that there will be a solution that evolved to perhaps scan a signature of the file that is attempted to be replicated to ensure that, you know, they, they, they are clean to, to post and clean to redistribute. I think there might be more advanced solutions, a bit like what they do with uh, video recognition, where AI systems will AI system will be fast enough to actually have any content that go through a node first checked against you know, a database of signatures that have been flagged as, as illegal. I mean, it's not just copyrighted content. I think there are worse use cases than that, such as pedophilia and uh, a lot of you know, bad use that IPFS will be probably attracting uh, bad actors to use. Yeah, I mean, you, you can already see that like Bitcoin is already being used for them, right? With the, the pretense of anonymity, right? Nobody knows who owns which wallet. Generate new wallets, you can pass money through a Tumblr. Like you can, you can do a lot of things um, to hide. Correct. To hide how much, how much, how much Bitcoin you have. Well, you yeah. can't hide how much Bitcoin you have unless you create many wallets. But at least you can maybe untie yourself from that wallet as a, as an identity. I mean, think that's yeah that's how. for yeah for some amount of time. I mean, they just they just caught the Bitfinex. Well, the, the alleged Bitfinex hackers, maybe oh, yeah. not the hackers, but the people who had the who had most of the Bitfinex stolen money. Yeah, yeah. I, I think what, what's interesting to observe is I think a new tech comes along and unfortunately may be abused by bad, act bad actors, but then it may take a while. But, you know, down the road, if that, that technology actually remains, I think authorities and innovators start building solutions to actually help tackle the problem. So I know of systems that actually do a great work at tracking activities on the blockchain for the purpose of, of criminal activity tracking. And I suspect that it's such solution that actually helped catch the, the Bitfinex guy who, who hacked it. It's probably a, a long, long-term tracking exercise where, the, because the visibility is actually quite good on the blockchain in a way. It's, it's, it's superior to what's happening behind Google servers. Any in independent investigator could actually just connect to the network, fetch all the transaction and do some um, some monitoring work. But if you were to actually investigate a case where Google was posting illegal content, then, well, you need a quick notice. You need to actually go through the legal system to oblige Google to hand you over whatever they want you to they want to hand over because they may actually even want to hide certain information they that they they deem can compromise them as well so I, I think I think it's a, a double-edged sword in a way for authorities it's it, it's a new so it's it's complicated it's anonymized it's access from anywhere in the globe it's there is no central authority to to help monitor so it, it, it's a difficult exercise but at the same time at least for technologies like bitcoin ipfs uh filecoin everything is in the clear about what's happening of course if you're like me and you you first encrypt the data with a very strong key before putting in ipfs i think it's going to be a bit difficult for them to figure out if my content is copyrighted all right um one one more thing i wanted to mention so you you mentioned the donkey and and torrent networks before, and you, you said how like you know there's a, a tracker right for torrent there's a tracker right which knows like who's got 
who, who may have which pieces of which of of the torrent, right? Yep. Um, are you are you familiar with the uh, DHT distributed hash torrent? Uh, correct. Yes. So the DHT does not re uh, require an entry point such as a tracker. I think the popularity of the DHT. So DHT is, I think, dynamic dynamic hash table, which basically means that every participant of the network has a copy, uh, which is a hash table, which maps every file, or at least part of the file of the network to the location, which means that it, there is no need for having to go through a tracker to initiate the connections to uh, to the chunks that, that uh, and connect to the peers that have the data. So I think it has reason in popularity and yes, makes it more complicated to fight illegal content on, on torrent. And I think Idonki also had a, the DHT capabilities. I don't know if it was ever really used all that much. I and mean, then Idonki died, I think. Yeah, I'm just I'm just thinking the DHT is kind of similar to IPFS where it's like there's the hash and from the hash you can look up who has it without a centralized server. Yeah, so. there are a lot of similarities between the two tech, to be honest. I Not to diminish the IPFS work, I think they They've done. Uh, they've taken a, a different route to to the system, but I think the, the innovation that started with uh, I don't know which one was first, but I think Idonki was one of the first peer to peer solution that actually worked. Uh, maybe Napster was the first, was the very first one, and then I think Torrents improved upon these previous discoveries and technologies, and then then IPFS and music was kind of last kid in the block. So although it's it's been out for a few years now. Hey dear, if you liked that video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and turning on notifications so that you don't miss any of our future videos. Thank you.